You may have already been introduced to a couple of measures of concentration. There are a couple more that we are going to need to use for some upcoming lessons, and even the ones you've already used are going to become more important as we get into chemical kinetics and equilibrium. So this video will be a comprehensive overview of all of these measures. Some will be review and others will be new material. All of these measures of concentration share a common structure. Amount of solute divided by amount of either solvent or solution. This structure is convenient because if we multiply this concentration by the amount of solvent or solution we actually have, these amounts cancel and we get the amount of solute we actually have. This is the main purpose of a concentration measure. It gives us a way to quantitatively specify the amount of solute we have. Of course, the amount is somewhat vague. Depending on the specific measure we are using, it could be moles, molecules, mass, or volume. Each of those could be either in the numerator or the denominator and the denominator can measure either the solvent or the solution as a whole. So there are a lot of different possible combinations. And as we will see, these different measures are useful in different contexts. The concentration measure that you are probably most familiar with, molarity, is the one that is most commonly used by chemists. Molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. Let's think briefly about why this is such a useful measure of concentration in chemistry. Suppose we have two separate solutions of reactants that have the same concentration as expressed in molarity. Just by taking the same volumes of these two different solutions guarantees that we have the same number of moles of each reagent. This is extremely useful for someone who is trying to design a reaction. Hopefully the utility of moles of solute in the numerator is clear. But why in the denominator are we using liters of solution instead of liters of solvent? Well, that's because adding a solute to a solvent can change its volume, and not by an easily predictable amount. For example, when you add water to water, the volumes just add. When you add ethanol to ethanol, the volumes just add. But when you add ethanol to water, the resulting volume is smaller than the sum of the individual volumes. This means that if we want to know the amount of solute in a sample of a solution, our denominator has to be the amount of solution, not the amount of solvent. Moving on to other measures of concentration, there are three common percents that are used. Mass percent is used commonly for consumer products and for alloys and other solid solutions. Volume percent is sometimes used when mixing two fluids, especially for some consumer products. Have you heard something described as 40% alcohol by volume? That is 40 parts alcohol mixed with enough water to make 100 parts of the final solution. The mixed unit mass over volume percent is used commonly in biology and pharmacology. This is considered to be a percent because in biology the solvent is almost always water and the density of water is one gram per milliliter. Unfortunately at high solute concentrations this density equivalence breaks down, sometimes badly, so it isn't really a percentage. We won't be using this unit in this class so I will leave it to the biologists and pharmacologists to explain it in more detail in their classes. A related quantity is mole fraction, where you take the moles of one component divided by the total moles of all of the components. You can turn this into a percentage if you wish by multiplying by 100%, although that isn't very common. Mole fraction is used in physical chemistry quite a bit for phase diagrams of mixtures, calculating vapor pressures of mixtures, and so on. All of these ratios that you can convert to a percentage by multiplying by 100%, you can also convert to other units by multiplying by another quantity. I'll go through that for masses, but remember that you can do exactly the same thing for any of them. Without multiplying by 100, you have the mass fraction. With multiplying by 100%, you have the mass percent. You can think of this as parts per 100. But suppose you have a very dilute sample where the percent is extremely small. Well, you can multiply by 10 to the 6th to get parts per million, or ppm. If even that isn't enough, you can multiply by 10 to the 9th to get parts per billion, or ppb. 10 to the 12th gives you parts per trillion, or ppt. You can go on to parts per quadrillion or quintillion if you need to. Occasionally, you will see parts per thousand, but that's only one order of magnitude different from mass percent, and the natural abbreviation is a duplicate of parts per trillion, so parts per thousand isn't very common. Unfortunately, you will frequently see ppm, ppb, and ppt without specifying which of these ratios is being used, and so you'll have to use context to figure out which one is intended. Sometimes they will be specified as part of the unit. 
ppmw, meaning parts per million by weight, which we as chemists understand to mean mass, or ppmv for parts per million by volume. In such contexts, ppm without a modifier refers to moles or molecules, which are equivalent since it's a ratio. Billions and trillions are modified similarly. Okay, almost done. Just three more to deal with. Molality, which you need to be careful to distinguish from molarity, is moles of solute per kilograms of solvent. Notice that this is our first example where we have solvent rather than solution in the denominator. For reasons we won't go into in this class, molality is the natural unit to use for several colligative properties of solutions, which we will discuss in an upcoming lesson. It is also a natural unit to use when temperatures can change significantly, because volume can depend on temperature, while mass cannot. It's also useful to note that for very dilute aqueous solutions at room temperature, molarity and molality are equivalent. That is because if the solution is dilute, the mass of the solution is essentially just the mass of the solvent. And at room temperature, one kilogram of water has a volume of one liter. Normality looks a lot like molarity, but with an extra equivalence factor, and it is used in acid base and electrochemistry contexts. Suppose what we care about is the H plus ion. A one molar sulfuric acid solution will produce twice as many H plus ions as a one molar hydrochloric acid solution. So we say that HCl is one normal for H+, but sulfuric acid is two normal for H+. Molarity is given in units of molar, which is abbreviated with an uppercase M. Molality is given in units of molal, which is abbreviated with a lowercase m. Normality is given in units of normal, which is abbreviated with an uppercase N. Finally, there can be a variety of specialty units that can be used in other contexts. To give a single example, imagine that we are interested in concentrations of a gas in the upper atmosphere, where molecule densities are very low. To look at atmospheric chemistry, climate modeling, or something similar. We might use units like molecules per cubic centimeter, or even molecules per cubic meter. In most cases, these specialty units don't have abbreviations, so you can figure out what they mean directly from the units themselves.